All right. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. And this is one of those cool Sundays when we have all the ages together, and I love it. I love it when we get to have our kids, our students, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, young adults, you know, really young adults like myself, uh, here all together. Uh, if you did not uh, get a Lord's Supper cup on your way in, we want to make sure you did. So at any time while I'm talking, don't be afraid to get up like, oh, we forgot to get that. We actually have them on tables in the very back of this room, right by each of the center doors as you go out. And obviously, they're in the lobby too. We wanted to make sure you saw those as you come in. I have a lot of stuff on my hands, so I'm going to set them down now, one by one, very carefully. That was really loud. Um, I spoke at camp, at a camp in southeastern Kentucky last week. And I'm just going to say I must have talked a lot or loud or something, so my voice isn't quite like I want it to be. So uh, if my voice cracks, you can just laugh. It's okay. Um, I want to ask a question. How many of you have ever heard the term nomad before? Nomad. You know what a nomad is? Someone who don't get angry. Uh, that's a terrible joke. <laughs> yes, I got claps. They were very much sympathy claps, but I appreciate it. Um, yeah, actually, I learned also after the first service that there's such a thing as a Chevy Nomad. I didn't realize there was a type of car called a Nomad, and I was told it was a very old Chevy station wagon with no windows. That's creepy. I'm just going to say, I hope that you don't drive one of those, okay? Uh, but... A nomad is actually someone who basically lives from place to place with no permanent home. Uh, I imagine someone with a big backpack, and inside that backpack is a tent and some basic needs that can help them have shelter. So they could literally roam around wherever they wanted in the woods, uh, from terrain to terrain. And then when it's like, you know what, this looks like a good place to set up camp, they set up camp. And then the next day they wake up and take down camp, throw everything in the backpack, and keep on going. That's the life of a nomad. Anybody here living the life of a nomad or want to right now? Outside right now, like right now in the rain? Uh, I don't think I would want to live a nomad lifestyle today at least. Or maybe even this week from rain to hot sun. But that is something that, ex that was greatly experienced in the life and the history of God's people. Uh, in fact, for 40 years, the very people of God lived like nomads. And that doesn't sound like a great way to live, does it? Now, there's a lot I could say to explain that to you, why they were doing that. Uh, that, that wasn't really God's intention, but they made a few mistakes, and the consequences of those mistakes was that they were wandering in this wilderness. And again, it was for 40 years. Now, I want to pose a question to you because these are the people of God. And these, if these are God's people, but they were relegated to living a nomadic lifestyle, that doesn't sound like you would expect the people of God to have to live that way. And I just wonder if at some point in your own life, if you've experienced some tension that way as well. In other words, I am uh, one who believes in God, and, I, and I'm seeking to live the kind of life that he wants me to live, but I'm not seeing the payoff that I expected. I expected my life to be better than it is right now. I expected my circumstances to be better than they are right now, and yet they are not. You know, if we don't, we won't really go into this in great detail today, but the people of God, the Israelites, so disliked their nomadic lifestyle, they so disliked their circumstances, they they actually wanted to go back to where they were before. And do you know where they were before? They were in slavery in Egypt. But they, they made this argument that at least while they were being oppressed by the Egyptians, the Egyptian people at least fed them three square meals a day. <laughs> and at least they had shelter. And at least they weren't living a nomadic lifestyle. They had a place that they could call home. And 
I don't know about you, but when I read that in the scriptures, it's easy for me to be like, how dare those Israelites? Don't they just get it? I mean, how can they be uh, so discontent, so dissatisfied? But if we're being real, and if I told you today that, hey, all of you who believe in Jesus, we're going to all sell our houses and just wander around northern Kentucky for 40 years. You're going to go find another church, aren't you? You would say, oh, Hickory Grove, my last day. My last day was July 17th, 2022. They, I, was following, I was tracking with them really good until that day, I'm out. That's what you would say, and I would not blame you. But the reason we're going into this today is because I do believe that in our lives, without us even really necessarily verbalizing it and catching ourselves verbalizing it, we probably say some of the same things the Israelites said. This was not what I expected. Where are my better circumstances? I, I believe in God, but come on. <laughs> why am I going through this? Why is this happening? And why is this thing happening still happening? That's where I think we can really relate to the Israelites. Well, what we're going to learn is that while they were living that nomadic lifestyle, God provided for them in very, very unique, supernatural, big ways. And even then, it probably didn't make them feel 100% better, but it was enough. In fact, I would argue it was just enough. And my argument today, what I submit to you today, is that we strive for more than enough, when really, just enough is enough. <laughs> so I want to read to you from Exodus chapter 16 today. And this is going to reveal to you one of the really, really cool supernatural ways in which God provided for his people. Here's what it says in verse 4 and verse 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, look, I am going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they will gather food, and when they prepare it, there will be twice as much as usual. All right, so this is an amazing miracle that every morning while the Israelites were living the lifestyle of nomads, they would walk out of wherever they were staying, and on the ground would be food, enough for them to take in. And what God said, if you've been here the past few weeks, a couple, three weeks ago, we did a message on Sabbathing, on, on resting. And this idea of taking a day of rest comes from the history of the Israelites. They would literally rest from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. And so what God was saying here, even in the wilderness, is so when you wake up Friday morning, I will double the amount of manna. I will, and you'll see it's called manna. I will double the amount of food on the ground so that you can gather twice as much on Friday and you'll have enough and you won't have to work or gather food on Saturday. You can rest just as I rested after six days of creation. This is what God is doing here. Now let me fast forward to verse 17 in this same chapter. It says, so the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what is needed. This is so cool. That God provided just enough for everybody. And then it goes on to say in verse 19, Then Moses told them, Do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it until morning. But by then, it was full of maggots. Y'all know what maggots are, right? Ew. Nasty. Little, tiny, white worms. And they had a terrible smell. Moses was very angry with them. After this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its need. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared. 
This is just an amazing miracle. And, and people have uh, speculated what this is that was on the ground. There's nothing like it. It was a supernatural thing that lasted for as long as it was needed to last. And I think an even cooler miracle is that if people gathered more like apparently it was good stuff and it was doing what it was supposed to do. And so people were like, let's get more. I mean, I know we're not supposed to get more, you know, but what if, what if God don't make enough the next day? And what if I just want more? What if I want a midnight snack or something, right? And so they, the people that, that first time period of this happening gathered more than they needed. And when they gathered more than they needed, it spoiled like very quickly. Maggots, terrible smell. It was that God created this thing in such a way to where if people tried to get more than they need, they would not get to enjoy it. It would spoil too quickly for them to have excess. And I'll just pause for a moment and say, man, we live in and expect excess, don't we? In this current culture in which we live, I mean, even as I go eat out in restaurants, the portions are just awesome. I'm just going to say they're awesome. But they're more than we need, aren't they? And we're used to that. In fact, we get disappointed when I say, that that seemed a little skimpy, you know, when really it's plenty. It's, It's enough. And I think that we need to hear this today so much because in our current culture, we're used to excess. We're used to not just having just enough, but having more than enough. I want my internet speed faster than I need it. I need my cable to have way more channels than I'll ever watch. This is how we live our lives. Now, I want to jump over to Deuteronomy 8, because basically in Deuteronomy, it's like God writing a history. And if there's a key word in the book of Deuteronomy, it's remember, remember. The idea of of the way God inspired Deuteronomy was like, hey, people of mine, children of mine, I got some things I don't want you to forget. You must remember these things. Well, this is what it says in Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 7. Remember, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna. That's the name of the food. A food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. Man, this is awesome. It's, I could say so much about this. You know, this is talking about a description of the land that God promised their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and, and they're about to go into it. But until that happened, they endured 40 years of difficulty where God provided for their needs, but just enough for their needs. And so when I read this, and I, and I sort of try to wrap my mind around what they endured, I hear God kind of like aggressively whispering to my heart, quit trying to take more than you need. Bill, quit trying to take more than you actually need. Because what you think you need more of, you don't. I'm giving you all that you actually need. So quit trying to take more. I actually believe sometimes in our lives, we're searching, we're striving, we're seeking, and we have everything we need right in front of us. But it's not enough. We want more. We seek more. And I believe this is what God is trying to tell me. I have uh, had people 
say some things to me before about my body. Recently, I've been hearing people say to me, you need to eat a couple of cheeseburgers a day, Bill Clark. I'm deeply offended by that. Shaming my body like that, you know? Hey, skinny people have feelings too, all right? Oh, although I appreciate people saying that, and I joke it off and laugh it off, some people think that I got skinny from running. Now, that definitely sustains my skinniness because right now, if I stop running and can you continue to eat the way I eat right now, you'll start saying, oh, bless your heart. How you doing, Bill? You eating a lot of cheeseburgers lately, aren't you? No, you wouldn't say that. You'd, keep that on, you'd say that to your neighbor, but not to me. Uh, but before I started running, I had an incident. I had to take a physical every two years to keep my CDL license. And the results of the physical uh, showed a couple of things that were not good nutritionally. And it was a bit of an eye-opener for me. So I'm like, yeah, I, I never really watched what I ate. And even back then, most people wouldn't say, at least to my face, that I was bigger uh, or anything like that. And I didn't really look that big, but if I wore the right clothes, I looked like a Q-tip had swallowed a bowling ball. I was like skinny, but not here. I was expecting a food baby, okay? And so I thought, I'm going to do something about this. And a good friend was saying, try this app called My Fitness Pal. So I downloaded it, and all I did was set a very, very, very slow progress goal to lose weight and just count my calories. I say all that to say this. When you start counting your calories, it's very eye-opening how much things are, how many calories things are that you're like, what? Man, I was drinking some crazy calories from Starbucks. I was like, oh, my lands, that's like a Big Mac in a cup. That's not cool. I'm not going to drink that anymore. But the other thing that was revealing to me is I found my weaknesses. And my weakness is when my amazing, awesome, southern cooking wife made a spread. It was in that moment that I realized I wasn't going for seconds. I was going for thirds. And if there was a particular thing she had made, and there was just some of it left, and it was like, do we keep it for leftovers? Or maybe we just, oh, no, I'll finish that, and I will finish it off. Because I don't want anything to go to waste. So in, in, in a sense, I was, the, I was the Israelite that came out of the tent And just kept gathering the manna. (laughs) Like, I want more. I want more. Like, I can't let any of it go to waste. Can you believe all of this is right here? And it's so good. And I had to break the habit of just taking more than I needed. But I feel like, and I know that's all kind of silly and way more talking about food than we needed to talk about. But in reality, I believe that I do this with my life. That I demand more than what is needed at times. I want to feel a certain way. I want to expect certain things. And I expect God to live by this formula that if I believe in you and I do life as best I can the way you want me to do it, then this should all happen. And friends, we learn from scriptures that that's not at all what God wants to do. In fact, if anything, he's trying to help you and I get to a place where he's just enough to where we don't need and crave and seek and search and hoard as much things. I think that's what he's trying to do. Here's what I'm learning. It takes faith to take only what you need, believing that God will always take care of you. And and I use the word take there. I would, if if you're thinking about this and if you're taking notes, Cross out the word take and put the word have there as well. Because take gives the idea that, oh, I could have something right now if I just took it. But sometimes we get to a place in our lives where we're like, this is what I have. And I want more, but I don't see a way to get more. I want something different than what I have right now, but I don't see a way to get the different thing that I want. So it's not like sometimes we're like, oh, I could take more or I could take something different, but I'm just not going to. No, sometimes you walk out of the tent and you've collected the manna that now all the manna is gone. The sun 
came out and it shone and it says that that manna melted away in the sun. Once the, the sun rose, it was gone. And sometimes we're looking for something that's not there and we're dissatisfied. And here's what I believe that God is teaching us, that Jesus in a relationship with him was just enough. In fact, this is what I believe he was trying to help us understand in one more passage that I want to read to you. In the passage I want to read to you, this is Jesus talking, and it comes in the wake of Jesus having done one of the most amazing miracles. He used a little bit of food from a boy and was able to feed in excess of 15,000 people with it, 5,000 men and whoever was with those men. And scholars believe it was probably 15,000 people. Make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ became a very popular man in the wake of that miracle. He just created a great buffet meal for so many people. But in the wake of that, he started to teach them something. And the words that he said were so hard for people to accept that many, many, many people that had been following him walked away from following him. In fact, so many people walked away from following Jesus that Jesus looked at the 12 disciples and says, are you going to stick around? Are you going to leave too? And Peter, being the one that often spoke up first, said, how could we leave? Where would we go? You have the words of life for us. And they did stick with him. Are you wondering what he said? Well, here's what he said. It's in John 6, starting at verse 48. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh." And then in verse 58, he says, I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. But this came off as so strange because basically what they were hearing Jesus say is, if you want to live forever, eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's pretty strange, isn't it? And what we do is we have the gift of hindsight because what Jesus was explaining was that his flesh, his very body, was about to be served up to the world on a cross, submitted to death to pay the punishment for our failures, our sins, our idolatry, our wandering away from him. His blood was about to be poured out right there on the cross in order to pay for all the mistakes that we've made, are making, and ever will make. And that if we would just believe in him, not only do we have forgiveness of sins, but this same Jesus stepped out of the grave. And by the power that allowed him to step out of the grave, the power of the Holy Spirit, we too live life today in his great power and have confidence that by faith in him, that when the day comes that we die, it's just our bodies that die. But we will live with Jesus in the presence of God forever and ever and ever. It's great news, but Jesus says the way you experience that is you partake of my flesh, you partake of my blood. That sounded strange. So people bailed out on him. But I believe this is what he's saying. A relationship with Jesus is just enough for you now and forever. It's just enough for you now and forever. You know how tempted I was to write that differently this week? I was so close to changing this that a relationship with Jesus is more than enough for you now and forever. But I don't think that's the lesson of the manna in the wilderness. And when we say more than enough, when we make him more than enough, sometimes what we're saying is that, Jesus, 
I want a relationship with you and I want your forgiveness, but I also want you to do everything I want you to do for me the rest of my life. And friends, that's not what this is about. We really understand joy and peace and love and the power of God when we sometimes find ourselves in the wildernesses of life, but trusting God moment by moment, day by day, knowing that he's got us, that we're his kid. And although I may not like my circumstances, they're temporary. And he'll get me through anything. And that, honestly, I could lose everything in this world and, and suddenly not get to experience some of the best, wonderful blessings or excesses that this world has to offer. And if I do, I can never say I've lost everything because I have a relationship with the God of the universe. I have the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, walking with me wherever I go. Friends, that's what God wants us to understand and believe and embrace, that he's just enough, completely satisfying, and all we need day by day, moment by moment. He is your daily bread. He is your sustenance when your soul is hungry. He is that cold drink of water when your soul and your heart is thirsty. He is your joy when your circumstances are sorrowful. He is your rock when everything else around you is wavering and shaking. He is your friend when you're alone or when others let you down. He is the truth when you don't know what to believe. He is your purpose when you don't know what to do next. He is your everything if you will let him be your everything. He is more than enough, but probably more miraculously, he's just enough. As we close our time together, we often talk about a next step. And sometimes we offer it as a task that you could just do. But today, I want to give you a list of three questions to consider. The first one's kind of odd. I'm going to admit that. But the question is this. What is your Egyptian master that God is trying to shift dependence from in your life? That may sound strange, but I want to back up to what we first talked about. The Israelites were delivered from Egypt and wandering in the wilderness, and they wanted to go back to slavery in Egypt. But God was wrestling them away from being dependent upon those masters and trusting and being dependent on Him. And I just wonder right now, if you're being honest with yourself, what is it that you're being tempted to run back to, to go back to, that is not God's best for you? and to be dependent on that, and to find your satisfaction and contentment, and to find soul and heart thirst quenching and satisfaction from that instead of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it helps to identify what that is so that you can say, my, oh, my, what am I thinking? I can't go back to that. That might be comfortable to me, but that's not God's best for me. What is that in your life that he's trying to shift you from being too dependent on? And that might be why you're going through some of the things you're going through. Perhaps you're going through your own personal wilderness like the Israelites had to go through to sort of detox you from your former master and to understand that you have a new amazing master who's not just a master but a father, a friend, and a shepherd. Here's the second question. What are you hungering for right now? Sometimes that could be so helpful. If you feel dissatisfied, what is it that you think you want to fix that? And maybe I'm going to make this argument, whatever it is you're naming right now, that might be something God wants to give you. I'm not going to say that, that whatever that answer is is necessarily a bad answer. But what I can tell you is this, whatever it is you're longing for, 
whatever it is you think you need, if that thing or that whatever is not there yet, if it is his will for you to have it, you will have it in his time. But until then, trust him and let a relationship with him just be enough because it is enough. And then the third question is this, have you let Jesus be just enough for you, for that need, but maybe bigger than that, for you? I mean, is he your everything? I'll be honest with you. I think it takes a lifetime almost for us to get to a point where we actually begin to see that our relationship with Jesus is everything we need. It is everything to us. I think it takes years, maybe even decades, for God to strip away from us our dependence on things that really he's enough for. So I don't expect any of us to be sitting here saying, oh, yeah, Jesus is my everything, and I've got this. I am right spiritually where I need to be. No, to some extent, every one of us here are wilderness wanderers. To some extent, every one of us are nomads. The question is, are you in a place where you're actually running back towards Egypt, away from all of this? Or maybe you're still in Egypt, yet to put your trust in Jesus? Or maybe you're wandering, but struggling. And you needed to be reminded that he is enough. Trust him. He's got you. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. And I want to tell you what we're going to be doing next so you can be prepared for it. And like I said, if you didn't get one of these cups as you came in, make sure you slip back and go get one. If you're here today and you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, this tiny little thing is a reminder. Any of you hungry yet? Who's hungry? Who's ready to go get some brunch? Yeah, I see those hands. Me too, but I got to stay here a little longer. We got another service after this one. But what if someone says, oh, you're hungry, starving, are you? Here you go, buddy. That'll fix you right up. Either a little tear will form in your eye or a little anger will well up in your heart. <laughs> You'd be like, that's not enough, Right? Of course it's not enough. But today, as you look at that and think about how crazy it would be for someone to give you this for a whole meal, this little piece of bread and this little cup of juice is a reminder to you that a relationship with who this represents, Jesus Christ, is enough to fulfill your heart and your soul and your mind for all the days of your life and on through eternity forever. Crazy, right? But it's true. And what I invite you to do after I pray is while we're singing one final worship song, if you believe that, if you have made and declared Jesus Christ and a relationship to him to be enough for you, then I'd simply invite you to symbolically partake of the bread and the juice, to eat that. And as you do it, do it as an act of worship. Maybe even voice a prayer while you do it saying, Jesus, I'm not good at this as I should be, but today I want to tell you, you're enough for me. You satisfy me. You're my everything, but help me to make you my everything as you partake. If you're here today and you're like, I'm still searching I don't know if I believe any of this yet. I'm glad you're here. And I hope that you'll remember some of the things we talked about. And maybe you're like, well, I can't eat and drink that because I don't believe that yet. Would you please take this with you and put it somewhere at your home? And when you see it, what I hope you'll remember is that everything you hear about Jesus that he did, the miracles he performed, the cross that he bore, the tomb he stepped out of, he did that personally for you, absolutely for you. And you may not believe it, 
but it's true. You may not feel it, but it's completely 100% true. And maybe as you see this, it'll remind you, you know what? (laughs) It's time for me to believe. Nothing else in this world is working for me. Nothing else is quenching my thirst. Nothing else is satisfying the hunger of my soul. It's time for me to put my faith in Jesus. When you do that, you go find this cup wherever you put it, and you rip it open and you partake of it and say, thank you, Jesus, for being my bread of life. Let's go to him in prayer now. Will you bow with me? Father, we come before you and we thank you so much for teaching us that you satisfy the deepest parts of our soul and our heart. Lord, there might be someone here today that has never placed their faith in you. There might be someone watching or listening online, and this is exactly what they needed to hear. It's time. It's time for them to take a step of faith. May they call upon you right now and just simply pray, Jesus, please save me and forgive me of my sins. Be my bread of life today and for the rest of my days and on through eternity. I will trust in you. Even when I feel like I don't have enough, help me to understand that you are enough every day all my life. Father, if someone's prayed a prayer like that, help them to know that today is the first day of the rest of their eternal life, that they are your child forevermore, and that you will walk with them through their life and satisfy their souls. Father, as we continue to worship and partake of the bread and the juice together, we worship you and we thank you for being our daily bread. We pray it all in the name of your son, Jesus.